Good morning. We're going to get started. We're going to uh, probably finish chapter five today and start chapter six. Okay, so five is a difficult chapter, six is not a particularly difficult chapter. Okay? Are there any questions before we get started? Anybody? All right. So we were la last time we left off, we were talking about molecules with um, two stereo centers. And um, if you have molecules with two stereo centers, the maximum number of stereoisomers you can have is four. And so we drew all four, and then we were assigning configuration to each of the uh, to each of the molecules one, two, three, and four. All right. So um, it turns out that these first two are an enantiomeric pair. And the second two are also an enantiomeric pair. So all they're, although they're not drawn this way, these are actually mirror images of each other. The first two, one and two, are mirror images. And three and four are also mirror images. I noticed something, um, I, I've lost my little brown case. I'm hoping I left it in my classroom last, last time so I can't point things out with my laser pointer. Um, but notice what's happening when we go from one to two. So we go, we, we change configuration at the first stereo center and we change configuration at the second, right? And that gives you a pair of enantiomers. And likewise, on the second enantiomeric pair three and four, we change configuration going from uh, on the left hand side going from three to four and we also change configuration on the right hand side. So when you change, if you have two stereo centers and you change configuration at both of those stereo centers, you'll, you'll have the mirror image. Okay, so uh, molecules one and three are not identical, they are not mirror images. Molecules with two or more stereo centers that are not mirror images of each other are diastereomers. Diastereomers have different physical properties boiling points, melting points, solubilities, et cetera, so they're not like enantiomers. Okay, so the, um, these two compounds, one and two, are diastereomers of three and four. So these are diastereomers. Of number three and number four. And likewise, three and four are diastereomers of one and two. All right, so we can list our um, enantiomeric pairs and our diastereomeric pairs. So let's list our enantiomeric pairs. So need to know how to do this on an exam. Enantiomeric pairs, one and two. And the second enantiomeric pairs, three and four. So notice when we go to the enantiomer, we, we started off with RR, we go to the enantiomer, we switch the stereochemistry at both centers to get the enantiomer. If we go from one to three, however, those are diastereomers. One and three are a diastereomeric pair. We have the same stereochemistry at one of the stereo centers and the opposite at the other. And that's what you're going to look for. So diastereomeric pairs. We could have um, one and three. That's one pair. We could have um, two and three. We could have um, one and four. And we could have two and four. Those are all diastereomeric pairs. And, and you don't need to um, 
You don't need to assign configuration to figure this out. If you just look at, if you had the pair one and three on a test and it said, uh, the test question said, how would you, uh, what's the relationship between these two compounds? So what you would do is you would look and you'd see what's changing when I go from one to three. Um, the right hand side is the same. Everything's the same. I'm switching two groups on the left. So I've, I've changed the stereochemistry at one of the stereo centers and kept it the same at the other. That means you have diastereomers. So you don't have to assign configuration. All right, so enantiomeric pairs, again, we've mentioned this, have opposite configurations at each stereo center. All right, and diastereomeric pairs have same configuration at one of the two and opposite at the other. So an example here is two and three. What are the configurations? SS and SR. So as you can see, for two and three, we've, stepped, we've kept the same configuration at the stereo center at the left, and we've changed it at the right. Okay, so that means we have, an, we have um, diastereomers. So, so this would be more typical. So look at the enantiomeric pair. Uh, we, we, go, we, we notice that we had RR, but again, we don't have to do this. We have RR, and this is SS. And again, all you have to look for is that as we go from one to two, we've switched two groups here on the left, so we have opposite at this one. And we've also switched two groups on the right, so we have the opposite configuration on the carbon on the right. So that's what we get when we have um, enantiomers. If we look at the diastereomeric pair, I'll just label these, this one's SS, but again, you don't have to do that. This is SR. And so what we see is on the left-hand side, we have the same. And then on the right-hand side, we have the opposite, don't we? We switch the hydrogen and the chlorine. So you can see that two ways. You can see that by looking at the RRS configuration or you could just look at and see, look for groups that have been switched. So when one's the same and the other is opposite, that means you have diastereomers. So diastereomers, oh I'm sorry, these are enantiomers. Enantiomers and diastereomers. All right, questions, anybody, yeah? Uh, does that mean we could use this method to get if two compounds are enantiomers, or should we see if they're mirror images that are not superimposable? Um, you can use this method to see if things are enantiomers. It's a lot easier than drawing a mirror image. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this works really well for that. All right, we're ready to talk about was a little bit more terminology, meso compounds. If we follow the same procedure above for drawing the stereoisomers or 2,3-dichlorobutane, there would only be three stereoisomers rather than four. So, so uh, on the previous page when we said how many stereoisomers can we have, we said the maximum number of stereoisomers is four, but you can sometimes have less. And, and that's what happens when we um, talk about this particular compound. And it turns out the reason that you have less is that um, one of the stereoisomers has a plane of symmetry. So just because a molecule has stereocenters doesn't mean it's chiral. If there's one stereocenter, yes it is. But if there's more than one, we can sometimes have arrangements where we have a plane of symmetry and sort of the, 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 the two stereo centers are, are going to negate each other because there's a plane of symmetry. All right, so let's look at this compound. And I'm going to label this. We're going to start with the R and the R. And again, when you're doing these problems, you don't need to assign configuration, but some of you like to, so I'm, I'm including that here. So what's the configuration at this carbon on the left? S. 
It's S, right? Because we've switched two groups. What about on the right? We've also switched two groups, right? So that's S. What about um, this carbon on the left here? What is that? Everybody seeing that? Uh, carbon on the right? S. So you can, already, you, you can already see how we're lining these things up here. And then what about on the left here? S. S. And this one here? R. Okay. And it turns out that these two are enantiomers, just as we would expect. And you would probably expect C and D to be enantiomers, but they actually aren't. So if you um, change to the eclipsed conformation, And you can do that a number of ways. Uh, the way I'm going to do this one is I'm going to keep the right hand side the same and then I'm going to just rotate this methyl on the left. I'm just going to go 180 degrees. So I'm going to keep the right hand side the same. If you have trouble with this, you can always put it into a Newman projection. It's a lot easier to rotate Newman projections. So I'm going to rotate this up so it's eclipsed. This methyl is going to be right here. So let's see what happens when I do that, when I do that 180 degree rotation. So right now um, the, um, the chlorine is up. Okay, so my thumb is the methyl. You might want to try this with your own pen and just a pencil. Hold it in between your, your two fingers here. Your thumb is the methyl and this, this is the chlorine sticking straight up. Okay. Now um, flip, it over, flip that 180 degrees. So now the methyl's up, your thumb is up, and what happened to the chlorine? It's not going back. Okay, so, um, so let's draw that. So the chlorine was coming forward and now it's going back. The hydrogen is, is going to be coming forward. So when you, when you rotate 180 degrees, anything that was coming forward is now going to be going back. And now you can see from the eclipse conformation that although we have two stereocenters, there is a plane of symmetry that cuts right through this molecule. So this um, has two stereocenters, but it has a plane of symmetry. Therefore, it's achiral. So C and D are identical. C and D are identical. They are superimposable mirror images. So they're identical. When things are superimposable, that means they're identical, right? So they're, um, we, they're superimposable. Mirror images. Therefore, they're identical. So what we what we we have a special name for this type of compound. We call it a meso compound. So this is a meso compound. Definition is on the top of the next page. A compound that has stereocenters but no chirality due to internal symmetry. So um, meso is not a relationship between two. If I had this on a test and I asked you what is the relationship between C and D, you would not write meso. You would write identical. They're identical. Each one is meso, C is meso, D is meso. Meso, but the relationship between the two is that they're identical. Okay, so um, compound that has stereocenters. So it's, it's it's kind of like the word chiral. Molecules chiral. That's not a relationship between two molecules. It's 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 a 
a feature of that molecule. So um, enantiomeric pairs, let's look at that, A and B. RR and RS. Diastereomeric pairs. We're just going to leave off D because D is identical to C, so we're going to work with A, B, and C here. So diastereomeric pairs, A and C, and B and C. RR and RS for A and C. And for B and C, SS and RS. A, B, R, R, S, yeah. S, oh yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I got a little ahead of myself. Thank you. That's an S. Let's do that a little darker so that shows up. Okay, yeah. So S, S, and R, S. All right, so um, again, leave off D. It is identical to C. All right, so how do you know whether a molecule possesses a mesostereoisomer? You could certainly go through the process that we just did and rotate it into an eclipse conformation. You can certainly do that, but there's other ways to be able to tell. So what you want to look for, a meso compound is possible only when a molecule can be divided into structurally identical halves. So look for a molecule with stereocenters each having identical substituents. Molecule with stereocenters has to be more than one or you can't have a meso compound each having identical substituents. So another example here, and I'm just going to draw it as a Lewis structure. We would have to certainly draw dashes and wedges if we were going to draw the stereoisomers, but this particular compound here Carbon on, so we have two stereocenters. Each carbon is bonded to four different substituents, so two stereocenters. The carbon on the left is attached to a bromine, a methyl, a hydrogen, and this group here. The, brom the carbon on the right is, uh, is bonded to a bromine, a hydrogen, a methyl, and this group here. And those two groups here that I just described are exactly the same. So if they're bonded to identical substituents, this will have a meso compound. One of its stereoisomers will be meso. So um, what you're going to look for is the RS, the RS or the SR stereoisomer will be meso. So again, you can do this, we did it up here, we assigned configuration and notice the one that was meso was the RS and the SR. Yes? So you never have SS and RR? Not in a meso, no, if there's two stereos. And it makes sense, if, if, if you, and, and you could do this again by looking at your hands. If, if our hands were, you know, glued together, we've got the right and the left, there's a plane of, there's a plane of symmetry that divides that in half. So it makes sense that if your molecule's meso, it has to have one stereocenter R and one stereocenter S, because that those are opposite of each other. So, it, 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 in order to have a plane of symmetry, it would they would have to be have the same configuration, opposite configuration. So that's what you want to look for. So a couple of different things. If you're not very good at assigning R and S, you can do this rotation thing. 
or you know depending on how it's drawn you can kind of look at it we've got the methyl up and the methyl down here and we know that if we rotate that this chlorine is going to be down and that hydrogen is going to be up so clearly that's a meso compound so a bunch of different ways to do that but we you have to always be on the lookout all right questions on meso compounds anybody all right Let's talk about stereoisomerism in cyclic compounds. We'll talk about five member rings first and then we get a little more complicated with six member rings but actually not. It seems like it would be more complicated but it's actually not. Um, so this is a reaction that we're going to learn about in uh, chapter 10. You don't need to know it now but this is a chapter 10 reaction. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a um, dibromo compound. I'm going to go ahead and assign configuration here for you. This is the R, R, and you get the um, SS. So we can say a couple things about um, these. Bromines are on opposite sides of the ring, so it's trans. And when we do this reaction, we get a pair of enantiomers. So this particular reaction yields only trans products. You're going to learn more about that in Chapter 10 and be able to predict that. Uh, but for right now, we can see that we do get trans products. We're going to call these a different name. In um, Chapter 10, we're going to call these the anti-products. But th that being said, the, we get a pair of enantiomers for this reaction. If, if you um, do a different reaction, it wouldn't be this one, but there's other reactions you can do where you form the cis, 1,2-dibromopentane. Uh, but as you can see, um, can you see we have two stereocenters here. We have S here. We have R here. So we have two stereocenters, but we have a plane of symmetry. So this is a meso compound. So um, this molecule is meso and therefore achiral. If you put it in a polarimeter, it would it would be you would get a zero reading for the polarimeter, okay? Because it's achiral. It's achiral. It is also a diastereomer of the two trans compounds here. It's a diastereomer of the two trans compounds on the previous page. All right, so that's five-membered rings. Let's talk about six-membered rings. And we know that six-membered rings are actually in a chair conformation. So sometimes we're going to have a compound that looks perfectly achiral, but when we put it in a chair, it doesn't look achiral any longer. So this is a good example right here. One, two, dimethylcyclohexane, the cis. And you can see that we've got two stereocenters here, but a plane of symmetry right here. So the planar structure can be divided into two mirror image halves. Uh, therefore, this is going to be achiral. It's achiral and it's also a meso compound. So again, um, meso. We've got more than one stereocenter but a plane of symmetry and therefore it's going to be achiral. 
So here's our problem, here's our complication, our potential complication that doesn't, doesn't turn out to be a complication. Our potential com uh, complication that a cyclohexane is not flat, um, the chair conformation, if we put this into a chair, it has no plane of symmetry. So the chair conformation has no plane of symmetry. Um, if we put this into a boat conformation, it does. So only the boat conformation has a plane of symmetry. All right, so um, we have a plane of symmetry when it's flat. It's never flat, though. The closest we get to flat is half chair, right? Where we have one, mole, one, one atom bent up above the plane. The chair is no plane of symmetry, but the boat does have a plane of symmetry. It will look just like this. So what do you think? Is it chiral or achiral? No, it's actually achiral. So all we need to do is find one conformation where there's a plane of symmetry. So does that mean that you have to put these things into um, boats? No, the answer is no. You just look at it flat. You'll be able to tell when it's flat. If there's a plane of symmetry when it's flat, then it's achiral. Okay? So that saves us time from putting things in boats because we're not accustomed to doing that. You haven't practiced doing that. So you don't have to do that. You just need to be able to look at it flat. All right, so is the cis isomer optically active? Yes. So you only need to um, find one conformer with the plane of symmetry. So basic, so, so, so easy way to do this, look at the flat structure. To tell if there's a plane of symmetry. It's not ever flat, but we can look at the flat structure, and the flat structure will be able to compare, and, th and that's going to make it easy for us to see what, what it would look like in a boat conformation. All right, questions? All right, so let's look at, um, let's look at, the, so let's look at some other substitution patterns. So this is uh, one, two, cis. What about one, two, trans? Um, we've got two stereo centers because each carbon is bonded to four different substituents. So when we're looking at um, this carbon right here, let's, let's do this. Here's the hydrogen. So let's look at this carbon on the top right here. It's bonded to a methyl and a hydrogen. And then now the two other groups it's bonded to are the two sides of the ring. If the two sides of the ring are identical, then it's going to be, that's not going to be a stereocenter. So we have to kind of trace it one atom at a time. So let's do that. We're going to trace it from here, here, and here, right here. First carbon is, this one's CH2, this one is CH with a methyl attached. So it's different. So that's a stereocenter. We could do the same thing with the other one. So we have um, two stereocenters. There is no plane of symmetry. One methyl's up and one methyl's down, so there's no plane of symmetry. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> Did I write yes? Let's see. Is this size rock with active? No. You're absolutely right. Thank you. The answer is no. That's on the previous page. Sorry about that. I said one thing and wrote another. All right. So two stereo centers, no plane of symmetry. Mirror image is not superimposable. Mirror image is not superimposable, therefore it's chiral. How do we know that the mirror image is not superimposable? Boy, I didn't leave myself very much room here, but let's, let's, let's sneak and draw it right in here. Let's draw the mirror image. Hopefully you left more room than I did. You're going to do it over to the right. There, that's, that's smart. Okay, mirror image. So there's a methyl here. And then I'm not going to, I'll just do it um, skeletal. There's a methyl here, right? That would be the mirror image. It, it might look to you like that's superimposable. So let's do a little, let's do one of those 180 flips again. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to have this be the methyl on the top here, okay? I'm gonna, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fold this to the left like a book, just like that. So um, my pen is going to be the methyl that's coming up. When I flip that like that, that methyl's now going down. So you see how it doesn't match this one? You, now your, your brain might not believe that, so what you need to do is you need to make a model of both of these and see if they're superimposable. And if you do that a couple of times, your brain's going to say, okay, and now you, then you won't need to do it anymore. But right now it might be just like, oh, come on, you know, not believing. So it's a really good way to just show yourself that that's the case. All right, so what about cis-1,3-dimethylcyclohexane? Is it chiral? What do you think? I'm seeing uh, two stereo centers, but I'm, I'm seeing a plane of symmetry right here. I can slice that in half that way, and the left-hand side is the mirror image of the right-hand side. So we have two stereo centers. But a plane of symmetry. Therefore, this compound is achiral and meso also. All right, now here comes the tricky one. <clears throat> is trans 1,4 dimethyl cyclohexane, there's a little bit of a typo on there, you want, I want to throw in an E there. Is this chiral? Who thinks that's chiral? What do you think? Does it have a plane of symmetry? It has a plane of symmetry. So one methyl's up and one methyl's down. If you line up the methyls and your slice down the middle cuts through one carbon hydrogen bond, the other two hydrogens are equally on opposite sides. That you're not going to believe until you do a model and show that. So you, you line up the two methyls. So one's up and one's down, but you slice through one carbon-hydrogen bond of that methyl. And then you slice through the other carbon-hydrogen uh, bond on the other side, and you will have two identical halves. Okay, so, that, so we, do have a, we do have a plane of symmetry. Do we have stereo centers? Let's, let's look at that. Let's look at one of them. I'm going to throw um, hydrogens on here. I mean a hydrogen on this one. And I'm just going to look at this one. Now we're going to, we're going to follow this uh, one atom at a time. I'm missing my laser pointer here, so we'll just do it with pens. So this carbon it, right here, we're looking at this carbon on the left, is attached to a methyl, a hydrogen. And now let's trace the ring. CH2, CH2, 
CHCH3. Do you see that both of those halves are identical? So that there are, there are no stereocenters in this molecule. So um, is it chiral? No. It has a plane of symmetry. Is it meso? Is it meso? What do you think? No, no a meso has to have se uh, stereo centers, but a plane of symmetry. This is just, this is not meso. It's, <clears throat> it's just a chiral. Is it meso? No. There are no stereo centers, so it is not meso. Question? The plane of she wants to see the plane of symmetry. So yeah, it, it's gonna. It, I, I can't really show it well here. We are going. We're gonna slice through one carbon hydrogen bond. So we're gonna line it up and then slice through so the two other hydrogens are on either side, exactly aligned. Okay, so we're just going to slice right through that way. So try that on your own and you'll see what I'm talking about. So yes? The of the I'm cutting right through them. I'm slicing the carbon uh, in half and I'm catching one carbon hydrogen bond. Now if I rotate that, I can make it not symmetrical, but you rotate it so that you are catching one carbon hydrogen bond. Hydrogen. You're going to slice the carbon in half and the hydrogen in half. Yeah. Questions? More questions? All right, so how do we separate enantiomers? We know we have them, how do we separate them? We can separate diastereomers because they have diff diff different physical properties. Enantiomers have the same physical properties. Um, so there is, so back uh, when, when enantiomers were first being discovered, Louis Pasteur separated right and left-handed crystals of tartaric acid using a microscope and a pair of tweezers. Imagine how time-consuming and tricky that would be. So. Um, Amazing thing to be able to do, uh, extremely tedious, not practical certainly. Uh, not only that, few uh, racemic um, compounds crystallize as separate enantiomers. All right, so he got lucky with that particular compound. So um, enzymatic systems, remember, enantiomers behave differently with other chiral compounds. So enantiomers are chiral. And so um, en enzyme systems perform resolutions when they metabolize one enantiomer and reject another. So we said for ibuprofen, the S enantiomer is active in the body, the R is not. So the R is just excreted. The S is used and there's no problem. So your body is, is util, util, utilizing the single enantiomer. Um, we can also do this when we, if we did, if you, if you ate racemic um, amino acid, for example. So human being plus racemic alanine. So if we, if we wanted to separate the two enantiomers of ibuprofen, we could extract the, um, the, the wrong enantiomer out of the urine of a human after they've metabolized it, right? And, and same thing with aniline. If you have racemic aniline, your body is only going to use the S isomer. So the um, S, is, S is metabolized. And the R is excreted. Uh, this is also not practical, I, as you can imagine. A drug company that just wants one enantiomer isn't going to have human beings lined up and, okay, eat this and then we'll extract this out of your urine, right? So, again, not practical. 
So what are we going to do? One of the ways to separate enantiomers is to do a, um, an enantiomeric, what we call an enantiomeric resolution. And so resolutions are performed using a resolving agent, a chiral agent that bonds to the enantiomeric pair, resulting in a pair of diastereomers. This type of resolution capitalizes on the fact that diastereomers, unlike enantiomers, have different physical properties. Okay, so here's the idea here. We have a racemic mixture, R and S. We react it with a chiral resolving agent that's enantiomerically pure. So we'll call it R, this one R, R resolving agent. And these two are going to react together to make some sort of bond. Sometimes it's an ionic bond, sometimes it's a covalent bond. And uh, then when they react together, you're going to get an RR when the R enantiomer reacts with the R, and you're going to get an R and an SR, right? These are now diastereomers. So we, had, we, we, we actually converted our enantiomers into diastereomers. Diastereomers have different physical properties, so we can separate those easily. You now can separate. So separated via conventional techniques, and then you, re you undo the reaction that you just did, whatever that reaction is. You undo the reaction that you just did, and you release an enantiomer, and now you have um, R and S separated. Why is that important? Well, as we saw with ibuprofen, you can give, uh, you can give a human being ibuprofen, and it's a racemic mixture, and the, the other enantiomer is just going to be inactive and just be excreted. But something like thalidomide, um, sometimes you have one enantiomer that's effective and one that's really toxic, like thalidomide. So you need to be able to separate the two so you don't, you don't hurt people. Um, all right, so here's an example of how this can be used. Here's a real world example here. We have R and S and phetamine, for example. So some of the drugs for ADD, most of the drugs for ADD are amphetamine. One of them is racemic and one of them is only one enantiomer. Okay, so those are most, most of the drugs for ADD are amphetamine. So this might be important if you're a drug manufacturer. So, um, and, and amphetamine has an amine group. So I'm just going to abbreviate that RNH2 to simplify things. And then you react that with um, t plus tartaric acid. And tartaric acid is a carboxylic acid. So we'll just use R prime for this different R group for the tartaric acid. Tartaric acid actually has two carboxylic acids, but we're just going to draw one of them here to simplify this. And, and what you're going to end up getting is an acid-base reaction. Okay, so that you're going to have the um, RNH2 is going to remove a proton from carboxylic acid. Let's just draw the arrow pushing there to remind us of that. Boom, just like this. After you do that reaction, what do you have? You have RNH3+, and you have a carboxylate. And that can form a salt. Okay, so we've got the negatively charged compound and the positively charged and that forms a salt. And you can crystallize, you can, you can do uh, crystallization and you can separate the salts by recrystallization. So you get uh, diastereomeric salts. So as we, um, as we showed over here, it's RNH3+. Plus and RCO2 minus. So what you're going to have, you remember we started with R and S, so we're going to have the R plus salt. 
and we're going to have the um, if we're going to have the S plus salt, those are diastereomeric salts. Then you separate by uh, recrystallization. And once you separate them, you uh, undo the reaction. So we've got the um, R plus salt and the R and the um, S plus salt. How do you undo that reaction? You add base. So you're going to add base to that reaction. And you end up getting pure R and pure S. So that is certainly one thing. One way to do that. There's also things called um, chiral columns. Um, a lot of complicated uh, things. It's difficult. It's it's not that easy to separate enantiomers. All right, that is chapter five. We have two minutes left, so we're going to do two minutes of chapter six just for fun. So uh, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that uh, chapter five is a pretty hard chapter. What do you think? Do you agree? I'm thinking we shouldn't have chapter six on the midterm. What do you think? Yes. Okay. So we are going to start it right now so we don't get behind. No booing or I'll put it on the test. Come on. Come on, guys. Be nice here. All right. So we write, we, this is, we're going to start off talking about the ways we write chemical reactions. And there's different ways we do it. And we're very organocentric, so we often just highlight the organic molecules. So for example, we could say this compound plus bromine goes to that. Um, this is a reagent. And we're transforming this organic compound into that organic compound. We can also write this in a simplified way. We do a lot of drawing in organic chemistry, so we have to try to have shortcuts too to doing our drawing here. That would be another way to, to write that. This focuses on the overall transformation. All right, that is a perfect stopping point. We'll stop right there and we will continue this on Monday. Hope you have a great weekend.